Yeah, this is uh, Ruben Cummings, and he'll be talking about uh, yeah, uh, data mining for fun and profit. <laughs> so yeah, give him a hand. Okay, let me switch. Actually, let me go back here. Um, so if anyone wants to uh, follow along, there, there will be some exercises uh, in here. And it's fine if you follow along in the presentation, but if you actually would like to do the exercises, um, then these are the instructions. Uh, so I'm on GitHub under Rubano, uh, and the repo is PyCon Tutorial. So if you clone that, um, and then the dependency that you'll need to install is called Meza. Uh, and just a few things, if you have pip, um, somebody had an issue before um, because their version of pip was outdated. Um, so just check the version of pip that you have, and if it's not um, at least version 7, then upgrade. Um, then once you do that, uh, if you know how to set up a virtual environment, then you can just do pip install inside a virtual environment. If you don't know how to do that, um, or if you don't know about virtual environments, then you can install um, locally just to your user. So you can do pip install user and then Meza. Okay, so before I begin, does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. Okay, so I'll just get started. So far, first off, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ruben. I'm currently the managing director of Nerevu Development. Uh, Nerevu Development is a software development firm focusing on API integration and backend development. I'm the lead organizer of um, a meetup group called Arusha Coders. Uh, so I'm, I'm from America, but I live in Arusha, Tanzania. Uh, and there's not a huge um, developer community, um, but those of us that are there, uh, we meet once a month in a group called Arusha Coders, and we just talk about programming uh, and just uh, various things about technology. I'm also the author of several popular Python packages, um, so one of which will be featured today is Meza, uh, and you can kind of think of it as an alternative to Pandas. Um, yesterday, for those who were, who were at my talk, um, I gave a talk about Rico, which is um, it's a library for doing stream processing in Python. Okay, so just to uh, go over um, some of the, the topics that we'll be talking about and the format. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce to you uh, how you can work with data, um, show you a little bit about what data mining is, um, some of its uses. Uh, there's gonna be some code samples um, and also some interactive exercises. Um, so if you have your laptops, um, when, we get, when we get to that part, um, you'll have some free time. Um, and if you don't have a laptop, you can pair up with someone that does, uh, and then you'll be able to actually do some coding on your own. And also, I don't um, expect um, anyone here to just be a spectator. This is meant to, to be a hands-on uh, workshop, um, so hopefully you're prepared to, to get your hands dirty. Okay, so first off, so just, just a quick show of hands. Who, who recognizes the person in this picture? Okay, great. I, I, I gave a, a talk earlier um, in Nairobi, and, and nobody knew who this was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so for those who don't, um, this was Star Trek The Next Generation many, many years ago, uh, and there's a character, his name was Data, and he was a, um, kind of like an android, uh, and this is, this is him. Okay, so the way I like to think about data um, is just how it's organized. So you have mainly two types, structured and, and unstructured. Uh, and if you have structured data, it, it looks pretty much what you're used to seeing if you work with Excel or CSV files. Um, so it's just a tabular formatted data uh, where the top row is headers and then the other rows are um, just the actual data itself. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have unstructured data. And so there are many types of unstructured data, but just to give you one example, um, if you just have a text file of raw text, 
um, then that's considered unstructured. If you um, look at it and read it, you, you don't really have much metadata about it. Um, so other examples are image files, um, just anything that isn't uh, in a tabular format. Another way I like to think about data is how you store it. So one way is you can have a file that's just a flat text file. And so with text files, you can actually read the data um, without any special program. Um, any text editor can open the file and you can read the data as it is. Uh, the other way you can store it is if you have binary data. And binary data isn't stored um, as human readable text. And it usually means you need a special program um, to open the data. Uh, and in the worst cases, you need a proprietary program uh, and you know, then they have lots of restrictions on, on how you can use the data. And then if you look at uh, these, these two areas, um, we can have different quadrants that we can you know, categorize that in. So structured binary data, uh, one example is SQLite. And so SQLite is essentially um, a database file uh, that you kind of uh, save as uh, a physical file on your hard drive. And so it's not like some of the other databases where you need to, you need to run a server. Um, you can have structured data that's flat text and a great example is CSV. Uh, if you stay in flat text and you have unstructured data, then that's just a normal text file. And finally, unstructured binary data, a great example is Microsoft Word. And so out of these four, um, CSV is great. If, if you're working with data and someone gives you a CSV file, then you're, you're in the best position. Um, Microsoft Word is pretty much the worst format that you want to deal with if, if you are working with data. So if someone gives you that and wants you to you know, do some type of analysis, then yeah, I'm, I, I really feel bad for you. OK, so now I'm going to get into a little uh, bit of a talk about what data mining actually is. Uh, so I like to think of data mining as a way of obtaining data from various sources uh, and then doing um, transformations on the data. And then after that step, you can also do visualizations. And so some examples of where you can get data from, uh, you can get them from websites. Um, so just from you know, the raw HTML of the, of the website, uh, databases, uh, even y your local file system, or APIs. If you're interacting with a web service that has a nice JSON-based API, um, then that's a great place to get data. Uh, and then once you have the data, you can additionally do some transformations. And so one of the things is you can transform data from um, the source type to dip, um, other types. And so in this case, I'm just showing um, CSV, JSON, um, RSS feeds, and, and HTML. And so in this case, it would be the actual HTML table. So one of the things that you can do um, is normalizing data. Sometimes when you're working um, in situations and someone gives you the data, they might not have it organized in a way that would be convenient to input into a database. And so this is an example. This is, it's still structured, it's tabular, um, but it's not, or, it's not normalized. You wouldn't necessarily store it into a database in this form. Um, so one thing that you find yourself doing a lot um, with data mining is normalizing it. And so once you normalize it, you get it um, arranged very nicely. So you have the headers um, in each row within the, the table um, corresponds to the headers that you see. So then once you have data normalized, it makes it very, very easy to do some visualizations. Um, and just to note, I, I really made these numbers up. I actually don't know what the cumulative number of, of independent African countries are over time. Um, but you know, I think it would probably look something like that. Uh, and so I kind of see those as kind of the main steps that you take um, anytime you're doing some type of, of data mining task. So I bet a lot of you are wondering, okay, yeah, that's that what data mining is all about, but you know, what's so great about it? Uh, so what I'm gonna next just show you a couple of examples of, of companies and websites um, that kind of under the hood, they utilize data mining to offer their core product. Um, so the first example is Mint.com. Um, how many people here use Mint? Okay, not very many. How many people have heard of Mint or know what it is? Okay, that's great. Um, so this is a, a perfect example. Um, essentially what Mint does is they, um, well, I, there's two stages. So 
the first stage, kind of when they first were starting out, they didn't have a lot of money. Um, and so in order to actually get the data about your finances, what they had to do was for every single bank um, and financial institution that um, someone was at, they wrote scrapers that would kind of pretend to be a user, um, log into the, into the bank's website, and actually um, screen scrape the data um, in order to populate their database. And then once they did that, they were able to categorize the transactions and then do a lot of the nice visualizations that, that you see. Um, now that they've you know, grown up, um, they actually partner with a third party. And the third party is the, you know, is an organization that actually already has connections to all of the banks. So Mint doesn't have to do screen scraping anymore. They can just get their, your, you know, financial information directly from the third party. So another example is Plotly. Um, what Plotly does is they make it um, very easy to create nice visualizations. Um, so you can upload um, Excel files or other types of data, and they make it very easy for people to create different types of charts and graphs um, without having to know about a lot of the um, coding necessary to you know, produce it if, say, for example, some of the things that you see in Mint, um, those are people who specialize in data visualization and front-end design. Um, you know, they kind of know how to do that um, just using programming skills. Um, but Plotly is maybe for someone who knows how to work with data, but might not know how to visual visualize it themselves. And so Plotly can you know, really help you do that. Um, so the next company I'm gonna uh, talk about is called Parsley. Uh, and what, what they do is they work um, with companies in order to help them kind of figure out the analytics behind um, the users of their site. Um, so if it's, a, if it's a media company that has lots of blog posts, they're able to provide analysis on the types of readers that they're attracting um, and you know, provide insight into how to get more engagement out of those users. Okay, so how, how many people here um, have used Pandas before? Okay, lots of people. Um, so I think Pandas is great, um, but I think for a lot of tasks, um, Pandas is usually overkill. Um, there was one time when I was um, working on a project with someone, and they used Pandas, and the only thing they used it for was to read a CSV file. Um, you know, so Pandas is great, it can do a lot of things, but if the only, you know, tool that you're gonna use is a CSV reader, then you really should you know, try to do it in a more lightweight fashion. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is just show you um, a couple of things that you can do in Pandas um, and kind of show you the, the equivalent of how you would just do it in, in raw Python. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about um, just getting some JSON uh, from the web and then showing you how you can manipulate that. And for from here on out, the data that we're gonna be using, um, the source for all of this is from Code for South Africa. Uh, and this is the, the website. If, if afterwards you, you're interested in these data sets, then you can, you can find more data sets um, at that website. Okay. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're, we import um, a couple of libraries. So the first one, um, depending, depending on whether you have Python 2 or 3, um, that URL open will be different. Um, this is um, all coded with Python 3, um, so that's the, the location. Um, the next import, iJSON. Um, I, I really like working with iJSON. Uh, what it allows you to do is if you have a JSON file um, that's very big, iJSON will essentially stream the file. Um, so you don't have to read the entire file into memory um, in order to do the analysis. Um, and so whenever I'm you know, doing any type of analysis, I like to use the streaming APIs as much as possible and avoid reading the entire files into memory. Uh, and so with iJSON, it, it just gives you the ability to do that very easily. Uh, the, data that, the data source that we're gonna be using, it's in the GitHub repo um, that I told you about. And so the base is just, um, you can see it there, so GitHub, um, allows you to access the raw files of, you know, any, in a raw file within any repo. Uh, and then the actual file that we're looking at is the crime summary.json. Um, so we use the URL open to get a, a pointer to the file. 
uh, and with the IJSON, um, what you, so you see that where it says items and then the F and then the item, so that last, that second parameter item um, is telling IJSON where within the JSON file um, should the data be extracted. So if you have a nested JSON file, uh, essentially that path should point to a list of additional JSON items. Um, and because essentially you want, what, what it is, it's expecting back is essentially like a list of dictionaries if you think about it in terms of Python. Uh, so in this case, the crime summary.json file was already in the correct format, and so you just pass um, item. If it was nested, say it was um, wrapped in an in a object called a response, then you would just have response.item. And then you can traverse like any part of the JSON file that you would like. Uh, and then what it turns back is data, uh, which is just a generator. And so you can call next on data, and every time you call next, it just shows you the next row um, within that JSON file. And so this is just showing you the structure that we have right now. So in this file, um, it essentially has all the police stations and the number of crime incidents, incidents um, for 2014 through 2015. Okay, so next, reading CSV. Um, so this is kind of the example that I was telling you before um, about the, the person who used pandas um, just to only read, read a CSV file. Uh, so that's not ne actually necessary. Uh, so Python has a great library called the CSV module, uh, and there's something called a dick reader. Uh, and so we're gonna use, uh, I actually don't use open, I need to get rid of that second import statement. Um, and so in this case, we're gonna look at another data set, and this is a filtered crime stats.csv. Uh, and so we're going to use um, the, CS, the Python's uh, open module from, from I.O. Uh, to get the file. And then all you have to do is pass that file object to the dick reader. And what you get back is also going to be a generator of data. Uh, and it's essentially the, similar to how the IJSON worked. So when you call next, um, you get a nice... Um, you know, nicely formatted Python dictionary. And so this is just showing um, similar stats as before, um, but it's breaking down um, each individual crime per police station, uh, and it's showing you the province and number of incidents as well. Okay, so next we're gonna read Excel. Um, so Excel is a little bit more involved since it's a binary file. Uh, and because it's a binary file, you can't really do this um, with, with pure Python, you, you, you're gonna need um, a third party library. And so in this case, there's a great li library called XLRD, um, and it, it's included as requirement for Mesa. So if you include, if you install Mesa, um, you'll already get this XLRD. Uh, and so what it exposes is a function called open workbook. Um, and we're gonna use the, the same, um, Type of the same type of data that we just looked at, um, but I saved it additionally as an XLSX file, um, just so we can see how it looks when you open it. Um, so once you have the URL, uh, you pass the URL. No, actually, just to, I didn't mention this before. So the, you see that second line that says FS base? There, there are some functions that are able to open um, files from over the web, so either HTTP or HTTPS, and there are some functions that don't fetch over the web, and they can only work with files on the local file system. Um, so that FS base is basically just pointing at the root in my local file system, and the some of the other some of the other functions, um, if you're using requests um, or one of the other libraries to fetch the file, then you'll see that GitHub base. Um, but for a lot of these. Um, they're meant to only work uh, with files on the, on the local file system. So just, just to clarify that. Okay, so once you use open workbook with the, with the URL to the file, um, you get back a book object. Um, and the book object has uh, reference to each sheet within the workbook. Um, and it's zero indexed uh, like most Python things are. So to grab the first sheet, um, we just call sheet by index zero. Uh, and then once you have the sheet, 
um, you can access each row within the sheet. And so here, this is just showing how you get the first row um, within the sheet. And so this is essentially just the header file um, of the workbook. And then if you look at the second row, um, then you actually get the first row of data. So one thing that you can notice is that you don't get a nicely formatted dictionary um, that the other, that the other uh, example showed. Uh, and then later on, I'll show you how you can do um, the same thing in Mesa um, and actually get back a nice dictionary. Okay, so next I'll show you uh, some of the things you can do with screen scraping. So you might have to resort to screen scraping if the data that you need isn't accessible over an API or they don't give you an actual file to download. Um, so this example is gonna be um, fairly simple, um, but there's lots of um, more complex things that you can do as well. So in this case, um, we're gonna use two libraries. So one is called requests, which is just for fetching fetching files over the web, and another is called Beautiful Soup. And so what Beautiful Soup allows you to do is you essentially pass it HTML, um, and it lets you traverse the HTML um, as if it were structured data, and so you don't have to do any XML parsing by hand. Um, it kind of takes care of all of that for you. Uh, so once you get the URL, you just pass it to requests. Um, you get the request object, and then what you're gonna pass to Beautiful Soup is the actual HTML text. So that r.text is just the raw text of the HTML file. Um, Beautiful Soup has a couple different parsers. So in this case, we're using the HTML parser. Um, that parser is uh, included by default in Python. There's also a faster parser um, which uses LXML. Um, and LXML is a C-optimized XML parser. Um, sometimes it's a little difficult um, to get that installed. So if you know you don't want to deal with you know compiled C um, C Python modules, um, you can just use a slower HTML parser. Okay, and so let's skip um, that that get data function um, just for a second and go down to the end. So w when you have the soup object, uh, what we're doing, um, you see the second to the end of the line um, that says soup.find table. So that find essentially looks through the HTML and it'll uh, fetch a tag. And we're saying, essentially this is saying find the first table that you see within the HTML. And then what it returns back is a table object. And so now that we have the table object, um, I just created a function called get data. Um, so get data takes that table object uh, and then if you look at the get data function, um, so you see another, another find type of function. Um, so now we're saying in the table, um, we wanna find all. And what find all does is it finds all of the rows within the table. Uh, and then so we loop through the rows and then for each row, um, we find all the columns. And once you have the columns, then we can actually get the text that's within it. And so once you do that, then you just get something like this. So it's essentially a list um, of, uh, and in this case what I did is I skipped the header row. So this is actually the first, the first row of data um, that you see. Okay, so next we're gonna go a little bit into aggregating data. Uh, so for this, we're just gonna use um, the built-in Python iter tools. Uh, and the sample data here uh, is just a list of dictionaries. And so what we wanna do is we have this list of dictionaries and essentially we wanna turn it into one dictionary and we want to sum all of the amounts within each dictionary and produce one dictionary that has that sum. Uh, and so in order to do that, um, so the key, we're just saying we want to do everything by the amount um, we look at the first record, and so essentially what we're doing with that first, so this is just an easy way to make sure that we have um, all of the, the appropriate keys. Um, so if other dictionaries um, don't necessarily have the same keys as the first dictionary, this will just ensure that the output um, looks the same as what that first dictionary is. Uh, and so then you can see in that sum function, we're just looping over each dictionary um, and we're getting a key um, where the key is amount. 
and then that extra zero within git is the default. So if a dictionary doesn't have a, um, the key called amount, then it'll just um, use zero. Uh, so once we get the total value, um, we use the, the iter tools chain method. And so we take um, that first dictionary um, that we defined before, um, we use dot item so we can actually get a, a tuple um, instead of using the, the dictionary. Um, and then we use the key that we already said, which is amount, and the new value um, that we just summed. So essentially what it's doing is just creating a new dictionary and replacing the amount with the sum of all the previous amounts. And so once you do that, um, then you can you know, just get a result with one dictionary. Okay, so now we're gonna group some data. So this is similar to before. So in this case, um, we're grouping by amount. And so what we wanna do is everything, every dictionary that has the same amount, we want to display them together um, within the same group. Um, and the way grouping works in Python, um, you have to sort the data first before you group it. Um, and in this case, it's already sorted, but you can't guarantee that it's gonna be sorted. Um, so you can see where it says sorted records. Um, that essentially just makes sure that the list is sorted um, by the key. Uh, we're using iter tools again, and so iter tools has a function called group by. And so with group by, you pass it the sorted records, and you tell it which key that you wanna group it by. Uh, and what you get back um, from group by is gonna be an, an iterator, um, an iterator of tuples. So the first tuple where you see key um, is just gonna be which amount. Um, so in this case, there's two groups, so one amount is 200, another amount is 400. And then the other end of the tuple is gonna be a list of all of the dictionaries that met that criteria. Uh, and so now I'll just kind of show you what it will look like. So this is the first group. So you can see that the first item in the tuple is 200, and then you get a list of all the items that matched in that group. And if you keep calling next, then it'll give you a similar line um, for each group. And in this case, there's only two groups. Um, but if there's more groups, then every time you call next, you get the next group. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the first exercise. And the exercise is looking at the data. Um, you want to find um, the lowest crime per province. Uh, and this is just showing you what, what your result should look like. And so in this case, I was just using the print function. Um, but essentially, um, you just write something um, in IPython um, so that you're able to see each province uh, and which crime has the lowest number of incidents per province. And so let me, oh. So let me go back to the repo just so you can see it. So this is where the data is going to be. And then the data file that you need So the data file is going to be the filtered crime stats. Um, so you can either use filtered crime stats.csv or, or the Excel file. Um, so I'll just give you, you all some time um, to, to get the data. Um, and it's pretty much using the, you know, a lot of the concepts that I just went over. Um, but what you want to do is you want to group, um, you want to group by province. Um, and then you want to see how many incidents were, um, how many incidents are for each crime, and then find out which crime um, has the lowest number of incidents. Hello, hello. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and show you the the solution that I came up with. 
uh, might not be the same as yours, but this is what worked for me. Um, so the, the imports that I used, um, so the Dick Reader, um, which I showed you, uh, the Open Module, um, Group Buy, and Item Getter. Okay, so I'll, I'll just step you through this. And I'm not sure why it's shaking. Do you, do you know why, why the screen is shaking? Oh, okay. Uh, so hopefully it doesn't, doesn't bother you too much. Um, so most of this uh, should be familiar. So just starting with that FS base, um, so that's just the location on the file system um, where the, the tutorial directory was. Um, in the next line, we're setting the URL. Um, so it's just that filtered crime stats.csv. Um, the next line, we open the URL and set it to, to F, which is a file object. Um, we pass that into the Dick reader to get the data iterable. Um, so next, um, this is an interesting feature. Um, so there's a module called operator um, and a function called item getter. And so we use that item getter function um, so that we can do the sorting and the grouping. And so we just essentially are saying that we want to group by province. Um, so I pass that into the item getter. Um, and then so sorted is now going to sort by province. And then the iter tools group by is going to group by province. OK, so this gets a little gnarly. Um, but essentially, uh, once we have it grouped by province, um, the key is going to be the name of the province. And group is going to be the list um, of each of the items um, within that province. So I'm just printing key so we can know what province we're in. Um, and now we're going to do another group, because within each province, um, there are going to be multiple um, items for crime. So we want to do another group by crime. Uh, and it's just doing the same thing we did before. We're sorting and then regrouping, but this time by crime. Um, and like I said, we want, the, we want to see the crime that has the lowest number of incidents. Um, so I just initialize that low count and low key um, to zero and none. And so now that we have this subgroup, um, we're going to make another loop um, and essentially just keep track of how many incidents. Um, so within the subgroup, um, on this point here, within the subgroup, we're going to sum the number of incidents. Um, so S, so, whoa. So S, hello, OK. So SK um, is going to be the, the crime key, and then SG is the group per crime. Um, so you, you can see in that um, comprehension there, um, so first I'm using int because it's a CSV, the, the integers are actually stored as text. So I just use int to make it an integer, um, and then I sum it to get the count. And so now I just have an if statement, and basically all it does is it just keeps track of the lowest count. And when it encounters a count that's lower, um, then that just gets saved. And so at the end of the loop, I can now print um, the low key uh, and the low count. And then you, in the end, then you get something like this. So that first print um, you see, it's just the province. And then after the name of the province, um, it's just the tuple of the crime and the number of incidents. So let me just stop there. Does anyone have any questions about that? Um, it would probably be here, I would assume, someone had questions. But is any, does anyone have questions? OK. OK, so next, I'm going to introduce to you Meza. Uh, and Meza is, I like to think of it as a lightweight alternative to Pandas. Um, it's available on, on GitHub. Um, and if you, if you pip installed it, um, that, that's where you can find it. So I'll show you some of the things that you can do with Meza. Um, so first is just reading data. Um, so Meza makes it really easy to read data. Uh, there's a, a module called IO, um, and it has various readers and writers. So in this case, um, we're just going to read JSON. Um, and like before, um, so the FS base is just pointing to the local file system. So you just give it the URL of the JSON file, 
uh, you get back an iterator, and then you just call next on the iterator, and then you, you get the data. So, uh, here, I'm reading CSV. Uh, and so this is just showing you an alternative method. Um, so instead of reading from the file system, um, I'm just using Python's built-in um, string I.O. And what string I.O. does is it lets you turn a string into a file-like object. Um, so essentially the readers accept a file-like object, so any file-like object works. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm setting, and actually that CSV text equals blank, you can just ignore that. I, I forgot to delete it. Um, but you can see um, where it says f equals string io. Um, so that's essentially going to be the content of the CSV file, um, and it's just converting it um, into a file-like object. So you pass that into read CSV. Um, you get an iterator. You call next on that, and then you get back a, a nice, clean dictionary. Uh, and then there's a few more readers, uh, and they work the same way. So here um, I'm showing you this is that io.read is just a, a generic reader. You can pass it any uh, file, and what it does is it looks at the extension of the file, and it picks the appropriate reader based on the extension. Uh, it also takes uh, an additional argument where you can specify which reader um, that you would like, you'd like to give it to. Um, that next one is join. So what that allows you to do is read multiple files um, in sequentially. Uh, and they can be, you know, any of the file types supported by any of the readers. And what you get back is an iterator um, with all of the data just appended um, one after the other. So if you have data that's in similar structures but spread across multiple files, then that is an easy way to just get one iterator of all the data. Uh, so next I'll show you how you read Excel. And so if you remembered before, um, using the, the XLRD module, um, there's you know, a lot of code, and you actually didn't get back a dictionary. Um, so reading Excel with Mesa, it works the same as any of the other readers. You just pass it the file name. Uh, in this case, I'm passing sanitize equals true. And so what that does is if you have an Excel file that has headers, um, that have funky characters and you know weird casing, um, sanitize will lower case the header names and replace white space or invalid characters with an underscore. So you you know do the same as before. You pass um, pass in the URL. Um, you call you get back an iterator. Call next on the iterator and you get a dictionary. So if you remembered before um, with the XLRD, um, you actually didn't get back a dictionary. Um, if you wanted to create a dictionary, you would have to essentially um, manually um, produce it from the header file and the data. Um, and with, you know, in this case, you, all of the readers you know, return um, dictionaries that are kind of in the same format. Okay, and then for the screen scraping example. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, you just pass it the URL of the HTML file and then you give it to read HTML. And what this will do is automatically find the first table within the HTML file. Um, you get back an, iter an iterator, call next on the iterator, uh, and then you get a dictionary. Okay, so now I'll show you how to do uh, some data analysis with Mesa. Okay, so this is a similar example to what I showed you before using Python, um, but in this case, I'm just using the Mesa function aggregate. Um, so if we have uh, a list of records and we want to aggregate that list by making a sum of all the amount keys, then you just call the aggregate function. You give it the key that you want to aggregate by, and then that last uh, argument is the function that you're gonna apply to those values. So in this case, I'm saying take the amount of every record and then sum them together. And then once you do that, you just get a dictionary with the, you know, with the key um, aggregated. And then grouping data is next. So if you remember before, um, when using Python, you have to sort your data before you group it. Um, so with Meza, it kinda does all that under the hood for you. Um, and you actually don't need 
that item getter function that I showed you before. Um, so with the maze of group function, you just pass it the list of records and the key that you want to group by. And it gives you back an iterator. Uh, you call next on the iterator, and it's the same as if you were using um, the built-in iter tools group. So it's a tuple where the first, um, the first element of the tuple is the, the group key. So in this case, we group by amount. So these are all the records with an amount of 200. And then the second tuple is just the list of all the records. And then next is typecasting. So if you're working with CSV files, um, one of the things that is not great about them is you can't really have types in CSV. If it's an Excel file, if it's a database, um, the type is actually encoded within the file. But for CSV, you don't have that luxury. Um, so here, there, there's two functions. So one is detect types, and the other is typecast. So I'm just reading in a CSV file um, like we've done before. Uh, but in this case, I'm setting the output of read CSV to raw. So where you see that raw equals read CSV URL, um, I, I just called it raw because it's, un, it's untyped. Um, you pass that iterator to the function detect types, uh, and you get back two results. So one is the original records, and then next is the result. And the reason that you get back the original records is because um, Mesa works with generators. And so detect types works by consuming um, records within the generator. Um, but it also keeps tracks of what it consumes, so then it's able to re-add that data back and then give you a new generator so you haven't lost um, any of the items. Um, if you're working with lists, then you don't have to worry about that, but this is designed to work um, on large files, even infinite, um, infinitely large files. Um, so everything is a generator, uh, and you just have to you know, be aware of that, that you're working with generators. Um, so once you have that results object, um, it's a dictionary, um, and the dictionary um, has a, a key called types, and this is just going to show you what it looks like. So that types um, is a list of dictionaries, and it has the key, which is, uh, f so one of the keys is ID, and the ID is just a column name, and then type is what it thinks that data type is. So you can see here that um, the ones that we care about, incidents, which is the first one, and year, um, which is the fourth one, it detected that those were integers. Uh, and then the rest, it just detected as types, or sorry, as text. So then once you have the types, you actually have to cast your data to those types. And so that function is just called typecast. So you pass it the records and that types, uh, and what you get back is the actual casted records. So if you call next, you can see now that incidents is now an actual integer, as well as year. So they're no longer um, text fields. And it does, uh, you know, it can detect basically all of the native Python um, text types. Yeah. So it depends on how, oh, actually, yeah, I'll repeat it. So the question was, would the year be better as date time? Um, so if you give it a date in the year, it'll detect it as a date. But since it's just 2014, then you know, it just said it was a text. But if you had any kind of, you know, if you had you know, my birthday, 5482, it'll detect it as a date. If you have 5482, 1 p.m., it'll detect it as a date time. If you have 1 p.m., it detects it as a time. So it, what it, basically what it does is it just looks at um, each row in the data until the confidence level reaches a certain point that it says, okay, I'm confident that this is a type of X. And if you have mixed types, it just picks the most generic type. So if you have a date and a date time, um, then it'll, det it'll just convert, it'll tell you that it's date time because you don't want to overwrite the times. If you have a, um, you know, integers and text, um, then I think it'll just say everything is text, just for example. Okay, so next, I'm just going to show you um, how you go about normalizing data. So if you remembered before, um, 
So in this case, uh, we have two records. Um, and so each record has a color. Um, and then this is a flower type, so Satosa and Versi. Uh, and this is essentially um, non-normalized data. So if you wanted to put this into a database, um, you wouldn't necessarily put it in that same form. Um, so what we want to do um, is we want to specify the rows um, which are going to be normalized. So in this case, Satosa and Versi um, you know, should actually be, you know, they're actually something else. And so in this case, those are individual species of flowers. So by rows, we're just saying, okay, which, um, you know, which keys need to be normalized? Uh, and then the arguments, um, which is the next line, are going to specify how you do the normalization. Um, so in here, in this case, these numbers, that five and six, represent the petal lengths of each species. So in this case, I just want to say it's a length. So I just give it that argument of length. And then since I'm normalizing by um, Satosa and Versi, you have to tell it what those represent. So in this case, these represent flower species. And so that's why you give it species. And then the third argument is just the rows that I defined um, right above there. So when you um, pass that into the, the normalized function, um, you get back the same data structure we've been working with before, um, which is just, just an iterator. Uh, so it's an iterator of dictionaries. And so you can see now the first one, so the color is blue. So now instead of Satosa 5, its length is 5, and the species is Satosa. And so in this case, um, if you go all the way through, you'll actually get four records, because each um, un, you know, unnormalized record represents two species. So you get two species per record, and at the end, you, you would just get four. So let me just stop there. Does, it, does anyone have any questions about that? OK. OK, so this is my attempt um, at comparing Meza to pandas. Um, so just in my experience in, in reading about things online, so Pandas is pretty um, complicated to install. Um, it's very large, has a lot of functionality, um, uses a lot of memory. So Pandas doesn't actually work um, lazily by default. Um, if you read in files with, with Pandas, it reads everything into memory. Um, you can do a few things to get back iterators, um, but essentially um, it doesn't do any of that by default. Um, it is very fast because it's compiled into C, so that's great. Um, it has lots of functions, and it can do a lot of input and output. Um, Meza, on the other hand, is very simple to install, just pip install. Um, the size is small. Um, there aren't a huge number of functions, but it does most of the basics. Uh, memory usage is very low because everything is um, works on generators by default. Um, I say fast, it varies with an asterisk. Um, because since it's pure Python, you can run it under PyPy. And so if you run it under PyPy, then, I mean, I haven't done any benchmarks, um, but if you run Meza under PyPy, you will get significantly faster performance um, than just, you know, the regular Python. Uh, and, uh, and it also supports multiple input-output um, functions. So I, I showed you, um, you know, a few of them, CSV, JSON, HTML, XML, and there's a few others as well. OK, so now I'm going to give you the second exercise. Uh, so it's essentially going to be the same as before. Um, but in this case, I want to see if you can use any of the Meza functions um, to make your life easier. And I did it myself. And since um, Meza gives you a few more um, capabilities, um, I was actually able to just print um, the dictionaries themselves. Um, so it's the same as before. You're going to have to group um, by province. And then once you have the provinces, um, you're going to need to group by crime. And then for each province, you want to see which crime has the lowest number of incidents. Um, so I'll give you some time to work on that. And then a little later, um, I'll, I'll just show you my solution. OK. So I'll go ahead and show you uh, the solution that I came up with. 
Um, hopefully, it'll, you'll see that it's a, a little bit cleaner than, than the pure Python way. Um, so first, just the imports. Um, so from, from I.O., we're going to use the read CSV function. Um, and then from the process module, we're going to use group, detect types, and typecast. OK, so the first part is, is pretty much boilerplate by now. Um, you, we're just setting the base so we can get the URL. Um, the file, same as before, filtered crime stats.csv. Um, and the difference here is now we're going to do some typecasting. Um, so we set the output of read CSV to raw, um, pass that raw into detect types so that we can get the result object. Um, we pass records and the, the, the types um, key of result into typecast, and we get back um, casted records. So now that we have casted records, we want to group it. Um, so we just pass that into the group function, um, and we pass it the argument of provenance. And then the, that nasty for loop you saw before um, is a lot cleaner here. Um, so now uh, we're still doing a for loop, um, but we just pass it into another group function. Um, so we get that subgrouped. Um, I cheated a little bit because um, I'm using a function I didn't mention to you. Um, which is called aggregate. I think, or maybe I mentioned it. I don't remember anymore. Did I mention it? OK. So never mind. I, I didn't cheat. Uh, so I'm using the aggregate function. Uh, and as I mentioned before, aggregate returns a tuple. Um, so you can see that aggregate SG1. So the 1 is just um, accessing the, um, oh wait, no, sorry. Sub, so group returns um, an iterator of tuples. So you see that subgrouped equals group. Um, so what we're doing, so right here, we're doing a list comprehension on subgrouped. OK, hello, OK. And since, um, Within the group, it's a tuple. Um, we want the actual list. So that's why that's SG1. So SG0 would give you the key that it's grouped by. SG1 gives you the actual list. And so that list is what we're passing in to aggregate. And we want to sum all, all, all of the incidents. And so that's essentially what it's doing. And since it's a comprehension, a list comprehension, um, that gets saved into that AGS. And so what we wind up getting back is just a list of dictionaries, because aggregate returns one dictionary. So now that we have AGS, which is a list of, dictionary, list of dictionaries, um, what we want is we want the, the lowest um, incidence within that list. And so to do that, we just use the built-in um, sorted function, um, which is Python. So we pass in the AGS. Um, and we're saying we want the lowest number of incidents. So we're sorting by incidents. Um, and since it's sorted, we just use, uh, we just index the first item. And so essentially what I'm printing here, so that AGS is a list. Um, sorted sorts the list by incidents. Um, I take off the, the first item, so I get back a dictionary. So now within each province, we're just printing one dictionary. And once you do that, then you get what you, what you see here. OK. So that is it. Uh, awesome. Thank you very much. So any, any questions? Uh, yeah, in your example, the last, uh, I think the sort function, um, it's, it, you are using a list comprehension uh, to, uh, to apply the sort on the list. Uh, what happens if the uh, list becomes really large? Um, is there a way to avoid it, or is it is unavoidable, I suppose? Mm, it's not unavoidable. So if you're grouping, 
So I mean, it, it, it depends on that. You, you need really, really big data, right? Because if yeah. the file is big, you, you know, you, you're, gonna, you're assuming there's multiple groups, so you wouldn't think that a group within the file would be big. If it is big, you can just nest by another, um, you just do another for loop, right? Yeah. So essentially, you, you can, what, what I would do, if AGS was big, um, instead of doing a list comprehension, I'd make it a, a generator comprehension. Um, I have another function I didn't go into, which is called chunk. So you, I pass the generator function into chunk, and then chunk it you know, by however number. And then I would do um, an aggregation per chunk. But then you have to aggregate the aggregation. So, yeah. Um, I can actually note here, one of the lesser known features of Python is that the, the min and max functions, mm -hmm. they actually take a key argument as well. Really? So you'd be able to accomplish this by doing min ags key equals key func. And ah, that's that, would, awesome. that would work on a generator comprehension as well. Oh, that is awesome. So that's another way of doing it. <laughs> wow, thank you. Uh, yeah, th thank you. It looks like a um, really great um, package, but uh, I just wanted to ask, have you looked at the tools or PyTools package at all and Dask because they have sort of somewhat similar um, aims, uh, I guess. Yeah, so I'm, I'm familiar with PyTools. Like, I've looked at the repo. Um, I haven't used it myself, um, so I don't, I can't really give a lot of insight into it. Um, what I can say is, is I've looked at other packages that do similar things, and I just found a lot of um, I didn't agree with a lot of the way they a lot of the ways they did things. Most libraries operate um, on objects, um, whereas this library only deals with functions. So if you look at pandas, for example, a data sure. frame is an object, and you call the method on the object. Um, whereas Meza, it just deals with um, Python data structures. So it's the iterator of dictionaries and you pass that into functions and you get back another iterator of dictionaries. So there weren't, I not, the libraries that I've looked at, they don't really work the same way. And so just in order to do things the way that I like to do program functionally, um, I, I didn't really see any, any other libraries. So. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree with you. I mean, that's what I, I think is really nice, the, the functional style. I mean, Tools does that as well, uh, and they have a, a, a a pain tools, which is pure Python, which you could probably run with PyPy, and then they have a, a, a Cython accelerated um, version as well with the same API. And they also differentiate between which of the functions are pure iterators and which ones consume the stream. So for example, with when you do a um, the group by, that for example is a greedy exhausts the stream, whereas they have a, a non-greedy reduced by, where if you supply a certain um, um, reduction function, it, it will kind of do it as you go go along without um, sucking the whole stream in, into memory. And they take quite a lot of care on that. But I thought, yeah, it's just worth looking at. They have much the same philosophy, just iterators and um, lazy valuation. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a closer look. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Um, hi, so I came a few minutes late, so um, you might have answered this, but just interested to know how you use this in your context in, let's say, a place like Tanzania where, yeah, like how, how applicable is data mining right now there in such context? Yeah, uh, so I guess the, the most uh, recent way that I've used it, um, so my last project I did, I worked um, with the UN on the humanitarian data exchange. Uh, and what that is is a open data platform, um, and they actually use a Python open data framework called CCAN. Uh, and so when I was, I did a lot of back end work, um, and a lot of it involved finding data on the web, um, and then importing it into the CCAN platform. So a lot of the examples that I showed you here are inspired by what I actually had to do to get d data from the web and put it into, um, into CCAN. So I did a lot of sc screen scraping. Um, I, you know, all of these input output readers, that's essentially what I used um, to put data in typecasting as well because CCAN is um, stored in Postgres. And so when you give it your dictionary, you have to specify the types. 
So I used the, um, detect, the type detection um, function so that I could tell it what types um, were going into the database. Anyone else? Um, I have a technical question. Mm -hmm. The type detection, how mm -hmm. does that actually work under the hood? And can you tune that? Yeah, so under the hood, um, basically the way I wanted, I thought about it was um, I wanted uh, a function that asymptotically approaches one. So essentially, the more items you get that match a specific type, the closer and closer you, you know, the function says it's getting to one. And so what it does is it just takes an item and then I have functions that test whether or not it's a certain type. And I just have a certain order. So depending on, um, so say you give it, um, you know, uh, the string one. Um, so there's functions called is, you know, is string, is int, is date time, et cetera, et cetera. So if you give it one and it passes is int, then, you know, that's a hit for is int. If you give it 1970, it's an int, it's a string, it's also a date. But out of those three, the most applicable is date. So essentially for each row, it just keeps track of what it is hit. And it also keeps track of which one is the most, um, uh, the most generic. And once you reach a certain threshold, um, so you know, in the current settings, you need like five or six hits in order to pass the threshold. So once it reaches that threshold, then it just exits. So it only reads as many rows that it needs to to reach you know, that confidence threshold. And then what you get back is the list of types, and you can also see the confidence levels um, as well. So. Oh, okay, so that's the other data in the types dictionary. Say again. So that's the other data in the types dictionary. Well, no, uh, other data in, in the results dictionary. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And can you configure this, or is it? It's, uh, yeah, so you can configure the confidence interval, um, and you can also configure the headers. Because it also, um, as an optimization step, I read the headers. So depending on what you call the header, if you call the header date, then it uses that as well. Oh. So you can configure how much weight to give the header and how high a confidence you need in order to consider. So the higher the confidence level you set, the more rows it reads um, in order to make the match. Um. Any other questions? Okay, one more for me. Um, mm -hmm. When you do the HTML parsing, um, mm -hmm. you mentioned it looks for the first table. Yep. Uh, how flexible is that heuristic? Because um, a lot of the times the data isn't actually in a table. Mm -hmm. There might be several tables, there might be lists, there might be just random elements. Yeah, um, so right now it's only tables. Um, if I remember correctly, you can specify which table. Um, the same with the read XLS, you can specify which sheet. So as long as the data is in a table, if it's not the first table, you can still say, okay, give me the second table. And there's also um, one case I ran into is sometimes files will have empty rows. So say you have a CSV file. They don't start in the upper left-hand corner. Maybe they skip two columns and skip two rows, and then they have the data. So um, the functions offer a parameter so you can say skip X number of rows and skip X number of columns. Um, so at least if you have dirty tabular format, there's still a way that you can compensate for that as well. Okay. Cool. Right, any last questions? Everybody happy? Awesome. So, yeah, thanks for the excellent talk. Okay. That was really good. Thank you. And, yeah, hand for ribbon. <laughs> <laughs>